So well, we were gonna shoot this uh, Hollywood office. Could just shoot the interview out here. Ready? I'm ready when you are, CB. Cornville, 1931 documentary, Tanner Irving interview, take two. <clears throat> What'd you say your name was? Denise, sir. Now, Denise, <clears throat> give me your best shot. Okay. Mr. Irving, how old were you when you first met Doc Boyd? Well, that was more than 80 years ago. Must have been maybe nine or 10. <laughs> Wasn't a doctor, though. His name wasn't Boyd, either. Really? And he wasn't any kind of geologist. He was eking out a living, swindling widows and orphans with worthless oil scam. Mr. Irving, you say his real name wasn't Dr. Horatio Daedalus Boyd? No, 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 no. His name was, uh, Bum... Bumstatter. Heinrich Bumstatter. <laughs> so why did he keep changing his name? Oh, well... The man was a serial bigamist, and he left a string of married and heartbroken widows all across the nation's heartland. Howard! Horatio Deadless Boyd it was simply the latest in a long line of aliases uh, meant to keep uh, creditors and lovesick paramours from filling his backside with buckshot, double-O buckshot. Because <laughs> he didn't start out with all scam. He began by selling uh, Dr. Enrique Alonso's Miracle Elixir of Life. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you've heard it said many a time, you can't put a price on your health. Well, today, my good friends, let me tell you right here and now, you can't. For only one dollar, one greenback, a mere buck, a screaming eagle, a trifling 100 pence, you can have the cure for every ailment under the sun, A to Z. Arthritis, first sight is conjectivitis, diverticulitis, fibrositis, gastritis, hepatitis, laryngitis, meningitis, nymphitis, and otitis. As a matter of fact, any itis under the sun will have more than met its match with Dr. Enrique Alonso's miracle elixir of life. Hi, uh, Dr. Alonso. Oh, yes, my dear. Will your elixir. My, my husband's a traveling salesman, and when he gets home, he is awful tired. He just doesn't seem to have the same old vim and vigor anymore. Did you say a traveling salesman? Well, after a number of run-ins with the uh, irate customers and some of them husbands, he was reborn. He's Dr. Horatio Daedalus Boyd, geologist and petroleum engineer. And he kept working with Dad Everett, whom he'd known for years. So Dad Everett was the wildcatter and driller? The unluckiest wildcatter who ever lived. His name was David Henry Everett. But everyone called him D.H. Most people thought that the D.H. meant dry hole. In 1901, he was drilling in a little town called Gladys, Texas. He was sure there was oil there, but uh, after three dry holes, the money to drill a fourth dried up as well. Two months later, a fellow named Lucas drilled a well less than a football field away from Dad Everett's. He struck oil at 1,500 feet, hit a gusher that blew 150 feet in the air, and brought in a well that flowed at 100,000 barrels a day in a place called Spindle Top. After that, he uh, drilled at a place called... Uh, Burke Burnett, but the drill bit, it stuck and broke, and it would cost a thousand dollars to get it out. Might as well have been a million. So Dad packed it in. Now that was 1918, and wouldn't you know it, the fella came in right behind Dad Everett, fished out the broken bit, drilled down another thousand feet, hit one of the biggest oil fields in Texas. After that, old dry old Everett was pretty much of a joke. Well, then, to these hard luck stories, Doc Boyd and Dad ever teamed up with the worthless oil wells. So Doc Boyd didn't have a degree of any kind? Oh, I didn't say that. It's a beautiful diploma. I remember seeing it myself. He had it printed by a fellow who did the artwork on flyers for what I was told. Very respectable bordello in Louisiana. <laughs>
What these two old rascals realized is that while they weren't much good at actually finding or drilling for oil, they both possessed an unusual facility for convincing people that they could do just that. Now, the first thing you needed in this kind of a scam was some farmer who sat on a dusty, worthless, hard scrabble palm from which even the most diligent hand could barely scratch out an existence. And folks listened, because what they were selling was not oil, it was hope. They started off in Oklahoma. Hey, you, you there. With you momentarily, my good woman. <laughs> First of all, I am not your good woman. <laughs> I beg your pardon, madam. <laughs> I'm not a madam either. I'm a miss, if it's all the same to you. Unmarried? Mm-hmm. You gods, is there some ocular affliction in the male species of these parts which medical science is unaware? In English. Are all the men in these parts blind to leave such a blushing rose as this unplugged? Mister, you see that outhouse over there? Uh, well, yes, ma'am. I, I mean, miss, I, I do. <laughs> There's a Sears and Roebuck catalog in there. And I get everything I need for this place from them. So whatever you're selling, I ain't in the market. Uh, madam, I, uh, my apologies. Uh, miss... Valdine. Miss Classified Valdine. I'm here simply in the interest of science. It's here, Doc! I swear it! What's up with him? Uh, pay him no mind, madam. I, I mean, miss. I mean, the man, the man is a, he's a mystic, and I put no stock in such primitivism, Miss Bardeen's. Yeah, I'm a scientist, pure and simple. Oh, I doubt that there is much about you that is simple. Or pure. Ah. What? Tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. That is Proverbs 10.22. Miss Class, if, if I may be so bold. Yes, on this very property in which we now stand, I believe that there is. Loyal! Loyal, dead gummit! I've never felt it so strong in all my life! Dr. Boyd, I bet my life, I, my very soul, that this land we're standing on has got a treasure trove that would make the kings of the earth green with envy. Oh, Morty, it's too strong. I can't control it. You better get him out of the sun. I am mortified, ma'am. I am mortified. She's not a man. She's a, she's a mess. Huh? What a woman that beautiful. Now, the men in this area are so blind as... I've already covered that. Well. Well. Miss Pardeen, I... I beg your pardon, but I don't consider myself a weak man. But that divining rod shook so violently, it frankly scared me. But I, I thought it was my emotion on thinking about the fortune that lies right underneath your farm here. I, or it could have been the Earth's magnetism. I was completely overwhelmed. You were. I were. Miss Fawding, this is about uh, opportunity and redemption. This is about just reward for the righteous. God's own bounty. Oil. Black gold. <laughs> you think there's oil on this land? Think it? <laughs> Nay, madam. I, I mean, miss, I know it as surely as I know my own name. Which is? Dr. Horatio Dalis Boyd, geologist and petroleum engineer at your service. And this gentleman right here is D.H. Everett. You a doctor, too? Oh, no, ma'am, I'm miss. I'm not a doctor. I'm a wildcatter, a working man, a driller. Miss Vaudine, this man, he's too modest. <laughs> Do the names Spindletop and Burke Burnett ring a bell? This man, whose name will be emblazoned forever along with the likes of Columbus and Marco Polo, a modern-day explorer, was the first man to discover both those sleeping black giants. Then how come you weren't driving a pure Sarah? Instead of that beat up Model A. Well, that's a very good question. I, I can only say that because I, I lack the capitals of going in and, and, and getting that 
oil that uh, I knew where it was. That those fines are nothing, nothing compared to the bubbling pool of petroleum that sits right beneath our feet. Reporting. This is a uh, geological and topographical and petrolifer survey of this fair county. But what it describes is a salt dome. Salt dome. Just so. And the anticlines, mm -hmm. and the faults, and the Sabine uplift, and the Rusk depression. Mm -hmm. And it discusses in some detail the Yagua and Cook Mountain formations. Names familiar, I assure you, to every geologist worth his salt west of the Mississippi. All of which means? Oil. Gushers. And you want me to invest in your venture? Oh, go oh, man. Man, we want to invest in your venture. So we will supply all the capital and the drilling equipment, the, the expertise, the know-how, and the manpower, and you shall receive a one-eighth share, which you will find is standard remuneration, but one-eighth of a fortune is is still a fortune. <laughs> That's a lot of bazooza. Yeah. We, we will assume all the risk, and you, dear lady, shall reap the just reward. Are you men religious? Oh, Lord. We ask your blessings on this venture, on these, your servants, that all the works of our hands may glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 What you have to understand is widows were the mother's milk of the petroleum hustle. Carl Fred Sims of Lathrop died after a lingering illness, leaving behind his wife for 35 years. Poor May Sims. Thank you. Ah, uh, the widow Sims. Clarence Albert Jones passed on to paradise after a short illness, leaving behind his wife of 29 years, the uh, lovely Therma Lou Jones. I'll take the widow Jones. Well, I sort of thought I'd take the Widow Joan. Oh, she's been married 29 years. She's got to be younger. Oh, yeah, that's, that's uh, kind of why I had my eye on it. You don't want to add cradle robbing to your list of felonious activities. I'm doing you a favor here. Well, as we all know, the older the violin, the sweeter the tune. <sighs> I'll flip you four. Whose coin? Well, not yours. That's for darn sure. All right. Very well. I shall console the widow Sims. But I get the car. It's my car. Oh, but you get the new by widow Jones. What do I use for transportation? <laughs> Their routine was a simple one. Each man paid a call on the widow of his choice and consoles her in her bereavement and says how shocked I was to, to learn of the passing. Of your beloved husband. Carl Fred. I mean, he was a good man. You knew my husband? Oh, yes, indeed. In fact, that's why I'm here. Because although the law of the land gives me every right to do so, I, I want to tell you I will not hold you to the agreement I made. With your late husband, regarding his investment in a particular business venture. A business venture? What business venture? Well, it's an oil well, to be exact, but not just any well. It's what's known in geological circles as the apex of the apex. Whatever is that? Well, my dear, it's something that occurs within the geological plates that make up the Earth's crusts, but only once in every 457,200 years. Give or take. Well, what is it that happens every 457,200 years? What happens, madam? Well, 
How shall I explain this? The mysterious and warm, wet depths of Mother Earth. No. Oh. Pressure builds up. Indeed, has been building up. Unrequited for ages and ages. Until it's almost as if the Earth burst forth in a... I hope you'll excuse the expression. Orgiastic release. Oh, my stars and goddess. It gushes forth in what some would say is a primal, almost violent explosion. It's as if Mother Earth herself had loosed the bounds of her propriety. Oh, dear. I believe that I have a slight case of the vapors. <laughs> Your beloved late husband, Cal. Carl. Just so, Carl. He recognized the potential of this investment. Yes, he was shrewd. Oh, sharp as a deck. But I, Mrs. Jones. You can call me Thermalou. Thermalou? Although I have every legal right to do so, I will not hold you to the agreement. You're far too burdened with grief and set upon with the loneliness of widowhood. The raft of the companionship of your lover and friend, your, your comforter and provider, the source of poetry and beauty in your life. The late Mr. Jones and Mr. Sims may have been many things, but they were, neither of them, the sources of poetry and beauty. In the lives of these women, for whom the long, flat, unending road of widowhood stretched gloomily out before them. Now, in addition to being able to quote the scriptures at will, Doc Boyd and Dad Everett had memorized all of Shakespeare's sonnets. And what did that have to do with petroleum exploration, you might ask? Love is not time's fool. Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickles come as come. Love alters not with its brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. Oh, my. That's lovely. Yes, it is. Well, a sonnet here and a slice of homemade pie there. Well, my dear, you are now the proud owner of 5% of the Cherokee Oklahoma Petroleum Company. <laughs> well, thank you, ma'am. May the good Lord smile upon all our endeavors. Dad Everett would roll out the cheapest, most broken down, sorriest excuse for a drilling rig anyone had ever seen. With local farmers pitching in on this truly poor drilling operation, a well would be smutted in. And then, when nobody was looking, Dad Everett and Doc Boyd would salt the well with quart after quart of canned oil. Hot fudge. Hot fudge, I feel like hot fudge. The next morning, Doc and Dad would announce with much flair that they had taken a core sample, and there in the cuttings bucket, they had no, no, found. We hit the woodbine sand. We done hit the woodbine. It's a balloon. It's like pent up release. Oh, my sweet Lord, amen. Amen. It was like a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Woodbine sand. Now all we need is a few thousand more to bring this well in. And we'll be sitting in high clover. Finally, I'll be able to ask for your hand in marriage. Oh, my shoe. Oh, David. So Dad and Doc would hit all the widows in the area a second time. 
increasing the size of the investments and the intake of endless slices of pecan pie from their lady loves. And then there would come the devastating news. We've hit a dry hole. A dry hole? It's completely worthless. And to make matters worse, my dear. We have incurred debts to bring in this well, which we cannot possibly pay off, but that is not the worst of it. Because you are a shareholder, the creditors may come after you as well. Unless we take prompt and certain action, you may lose your home. But fear not. I would sooner lose my life than allow that to happen to you. You have but to sign over all your worthless shares to me, and I will assume full responsibility that they'll never be able to touch you. Of course, it means that, well, I'll have to flee or, or, or be incarcerated. But I will gladly make that sacrifice for the woman I have come to love so dearly. With that, the manly lovers would steal off into the night as the widows whipped tears of gratitude. and clutched the love letters that were written to them over the last few months to their widow's bosoms. built every widow they could find in Oklahoma, they decided it was time to come to Texas. Hey, 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 look, here's a likely prospect. Look, little town called Cornville. Cornville, where's that? It's next to a little town called Mule Shoot. I'm oh. sure it's seen. Outhouse of the universe. But listen to this. Thurman Dial declared dead today. Declared? What do you mean declared? Well, I'm guessing when missing in Mexico, prospecting five years ago and never to return. So his lovely bride of 30 years, Juna Paris, Sue Dial, she had to declare him dead to collect insurance. I'm sure it didn't amount to a hill of beans. Hmm. Oh, what? You know what? I'll get directions to Cornville. <laughs> We're good. So this is Texas. Very flat. From appearances, those may be the kindest words I can say. You know, I think those Oklahoma winners gave us a brand new car. <laughs> I can't say we really knew him, Mrs. Dial. We, we spent an evening with him. In Mexico. Oh, just outside of Juarez. We, we were looking for oil. Uh, it didn't pan out. No, no, that's uh, when we talked to... Uh... Thurman. Mm. Right, <laughs> over a plate of moles and frijoles. Uh, yeah, he told us about this hunch that he had. It was more than a hunch. See, actually, a gypsy fortune teller foretold his future, saying that, well, oil would be discovered on his ranch. It would make him and his beloved Juniper Sue wealthy beyond measure. That is so unlike him. Well, uh, Mexico will bring that out in a fella. 
And so you traveled all this way. To conduct um, uh, several scientific experiments to see that, well, to see if what he said was actually true, and to our amazement, well, it, it was. Yeah, well, well, there you go. Uh, this is a geographical, topographical, and petrolifous survey of the areas surrounding Mule Chute and uh, Cornville, Texas. Yeah, and what it describes, my dear uh, Mrs. Dial, is uh, a salt dome. A salt dome. Just so. Yeah, you have the uh, Antiques, the uh, Faults, and the Sabine uh, Uplift. And, and, and the uh, Rusk Depression. Yeah, and the Yagu and Cook Mountain Formations. Names familiar, I, I assure you, to every geologist with his salt west of the Mississippi. It is a season of miracles. Praise Jesus. Amen. Amen. First, Thurman literally coming back from the dead, and now what this fortune teller prophesied becoming a reality. Uh, coming back from the dead? Wh whatever do you mean, dear lady? Why, the day after I had to go down to the county office to declare Thurman dead, up the road comes the, the dustiest, the dirtiest tramp you ever did see. I was afraid of him. I don't mind saying so. So I, I pulled out Thurman's shotgun and I said, get! And who do you think it was? My Thurman, praise the Lord, my own dear sweet husband. But it's just a, a modern day Lazarus. That's what it was. Uh -oh. That must be Thurman now. Y'all can tell them about our good fortune yourselves. Mm. Jesus. Oh, yes, praise Jesus in all his glory. No, no, man, man, <laughs> maybe we should talk about it. Just... Thurman, honey, these men have good news. You've got to be kidding me. Uh, oh, boy, maybe we should come back another day. You know, what with all your good news. Oh, well, uh... Thurman, big fella, how are you? By golly, just a mountain of a man. Who are you? Don't you know these men, dear? They said that you met them in Juarez. Well, just outside of Juarez. And you told them about the fortune teller? I don't remember no fortune teller, and I don't remember neither one of them either. Well, it was dark. Remember how dark that place was? Oh, very dark. I don't know you two fellas, and I don't know about a fortune teller. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it could have been somebody else, you know. There, there's a lot of large men south of the border. I don't know what you're talking about, I tell you. Case of mistaken identity, no, no, no harm, no foul. We'll go. Oh, no, 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 you won't! Oh, no, no, no ma'am, I, I can explain. It's the amnesia. Amnesia? Mm. I don't know them, I tell you. You calm down, Thurman, honey. Remember what the doctor said. Doctor? What'd the doctor say? Thurman got hit on the head by some banditos. They robbed him blind and they left him to die, but he didn't die. And then one day, one word came into his mind. Cornville. Cornville. Mm -hmm. He knew it was home, and he knew he had to make it back here, and he did make it back. And then Della called down at the general store. She recognized him, and she said, Praise Jesus, Thurman Dial has risen from the dead. He doesn't hardly remember a thing, but he found his way home. Oh, Lord, we owe you for this one. Praise Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Cornville. Oh, I got the collie wobbles for sure. Oil dead gummy. It's the strongest I've ever felt, Dr. Boyd. That gypsy fortune teller was right. There's oil here. Oh, Lord. Lordy, Lordy, it's too strong for me. We should get him out of the sun. He, uh, tends to over And so, on May 8th, 1930, Dad and Doc began skidding their rig across the Dial Ranch to the place that Dad Everett, Almighty Providence, and the imaginary gypsy fortune teller had all predetermined as the site upon which their fortunes would be made. Well, what the heck was that? This broken down, rotten piece of junk. Take it easy. This thing is just held together with spit and bailing wire. You know, it, uh, it doesn't matter, Dad. 
Yeah, but the drill site's still a quarter mile away from here. <laughs> well, Thurman, that's true, but that's a drill site. It's not the drill site. What do you mean? Well, I just believe the hand of Providence has been guiding our every step. But the place where Mr. Everett swung with the forked stick, that's where he said the oil is. Yes, but uh, this is where the uh, cottonwood tree is. The cottonwood tree? The cottonwood tree. Don't you remember what that gypsy fortune teller said to you? No. Oh, my gosh, yeah, I, I agree with you, Doc. You know, I've been so bullheaded and to get to where I'm going, I didn't see what was right in front of me. The bride providence of that fortune teller's uh, fortune teller. Remember, you told us that the gypsy fortune teller said that you would find oil right here on your place, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, she said it was no more than uh, 50 paces from the cottonwood tree. Yep. And I clean forgot about that until that wagon broke down right here. I'm going to pace it off right now. Good idea. One, two. Three, four, five, six. I'm sure seven, glad your memory's eight. better than mine. Oh, no, no, no. I believe that the, the good Lord himself saw what we were too blind to see. What, what, what was right in front of us? The cottonwood tree. 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 49, 50. Doc, that's 50 faces right on the butt. No more, no less. That confirms it. Thurman, we're gonna drill right here. And at 3,500 feet, we're gonna hit the Woodbine sand. I, I would stick my reputation on it. And if we're so bullheaded that we turn away from the spot that the good Lord himself has revealed to us, then we do not deserve the fortune that he has literally laid out at our feet. Amen. Amen. All right, boys, unload that wood. <laughs> And now that they had a well, it was time to hit every widow they could find in a three-county radius. Now, Cornville had a colored population, too. The races didn't mix, but relations were fairly cordial. The one thing that united black and white alike was poverty. But still in all, most of the whites wouldn't buy wood from my father, even though he was the only wood carter in town. They bought from the white man over in New Street, even though it was 20 miles away. Now, in those days, the well pumps ran on steam power, and that meant a boiler and wood to burn. Old Doc Boyd and Dad Everett knew how to stretch a dollar. So if father would give them wood cheaper, they'd buy from him and no two ways about it. And if anybody said anything different, old Dad Everett would just say, Now, Mr. Irving, well, he gave me the best price, so he's got my business. Good day, gentlemen. Mighty fine cooking, Mrs. Irving. Mighty fine. Thank you, Mr. Everett. There are quite a few people in this town that wouldn't look too kindly on you having dinner with us. That's the gospel truth. Well, that's, uh, that's their problem. It's not ours. I've, uh, never been known to turn down a free meal, so... <laughs> now, Mr. Tanner, you made mention of a business deal that you wanted to discuss with us. Are you a real geologist, Doc? Or is this just some kind of flim-flam you're pulling on, folks? I, I mean no offense, I just... Gotta know. 
You uh, you got to know, huh? Well, why, why, why is that? Someone, someone appoint you sheriff while I wasn't looking? I got to know, Doc, because I'm thinking of investing. Oh. Well, that, that's another story. That's very prudent of you too, Mr. Tanner, to do your due diligence. There, there you go. PhD in geology and petroleum engineering, granted by the University of Heidelberg. And what's this half-naked lady up here in the corner? Oh, uh, yeah, well, that, um, that, madam, that is the, uh, Greek goddess, Petrolia. Yeah, she's, uh, goddess over everything petroliferous. That is right. Huh. You see, that's how you got an official diploma and all. With a Greek goddess on it. I'll take a chance on you. Well, that is good news, Mr. Irving. Now, look, for only... Five hundred dollars. I don't have five hundred dollars, but I can supply you with firewood, and you can pay me with stock certificates. Wow, well, uh, you done made yourself a deal, sir. <laughs> but, but now they're gonna be even more white folk that ain't gonna be too happy with you having a color partner. Ah. When I see money, I don't see black, I don't see white, I only see green, and that's the only color that concerns me. Well, there's a fine ending to a. Very festive evening. Thank you. Now, if, if you'll excuse me, I, I have to pay a condolence call to the widow Tyler. That is one good man right there. It's a heart of gold. How about some apple pie for you, Dr. Boyd? It's a family favorite. Oh, I never say no to apple pie, ma'am. Thank you very much. <laughs> I got to admit, I ain't never heard of no Greek goddess Petrolia. Only Greek god I ever heard of was Hercules. Oh. He was a good one. Mr. Everett, you haven't hardly touched a bite of your supper. I must confess, dear lady, that I ate before I got here. You know, I have to confess. Mr. Woodrow and I didn't have... Well, you know, there's a, a certain passion, a, a flame, you might say, that went out many, many years ago. I find that hard to believe. Oh, it's been a good long while since I've had a man in my parlor with whom I've exchanged more than a few sentences. Past the greens or the chicken was the only conversation we ever had. If that was the case, then your husband deprived himself of one of the most charming companions. Mr. Everett, you appear to be crying. Are you all right? Tears of joy, my lady. Tears of joy at being able to confess my affections openly and without guile to one of the fairest creatures I have ever met. Mr. Everett. She running, Thurman. Running good, Doc. You know, every day I'm remembering more and more, but I swear I can't remember a thing of you or Dad or any fortune teller. I think a man would remember something that important. Well, you mustn't be impatient, Thurman. Good Lord, he works in his own sweet time. I'm just gonna have a little look-see at the cuttings bucket. Won't be long before we're gonna bring it up and find the old woodbine sand. I hope so. There's a lot of good folk around here counting on it. Yeah, yeah, I know it's uh, it's tough times out there for everyone. They're living off a of credit at our general store, and I don't know how much longer we can all hold on. Good Lord. What's that senile old fool gone and done now? You old fool. Yeah. What kind of it? Dad, what in tarnation were you thinking last night? I wasn't thinking of anything, Doc. I was putty in her hands. What are you doing? Pouring cans of oil down that well this early. Oh, I didn't 
40 kids have all done any well. You didn't pour oil down in the core samples. Wait a minute. You're telling me there's oil in the cuttings bucket? See for yourself. Somebody's on to us. Somebody's trying to hustle the hustlers. We, we, we saying somebody else salted that well? Of course somebody else salted that well. They're trying to spread the rumor that there's oil up here, and then they're gonna buy up all the leases of worthless mineral rights, and syndicate them, then sell them, and before you know it, our stuff won't be worth chicken feed. I'll bet it's that Thurman. You know, he's, he's not as dumb as he looks. Oh, the gall of that man trying to cheat us. You know, there's one more possibility. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. <laughs> really? Yeah. How long do we have to wait till we can take a real course in. Uh, Doc, why don't you step over here? That's Woodbine Sand. Yeah, that's Woodbine Sand. Yeah, we done hit the Woodbine Sand there, Dad. <laughs> we done hit the Woodbine Sand. Oh, Lordy, we hit the Woodbine Sand! Oh, my Lordy, buddy! We hit the Woodbine! Ah, we done hit the Woodbine Sand, D.H. Oh, yes, we did. Lordy, 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 my Savior! Jesus Christ! Thank you! Yes, yes, yes! Yes! <laughs> We are rich. Oh, we're richer than Solomon. We're richer than Pharaoh himself. Yes, we are, sir. Woohoo! I'm telling you right now, it is a miracle. Her name's gonna be Doreen. That's it. I'll find me a dancer lady named Doreen. <laughs> First thing I'm gonna do is get myself some dancing lessons. Ha ha! Yeah! Hi! Yeah! Oh! Yeah, you know what I'm gonna do with all that money. <laughs> What's the matter with you? You, you fool, dance. You know, make a joyous noise before the Lord. I mean, how many times have you been a millionaire? We've struck oil here. Dad. What? Right. We can't bring it in. What are you talking about? It's well. We can't bring it in. Of course we can. We'll just go to the widows, get some more money, buy ourselves a new rig, get rid of this piece of junk. We've already sold close to 500%. Yeah, so we'll just sell some more. Not gonna give up now. Well, we got a gusher to bring in. You're not listening to me. I said we sold 500% of the shares. You can only have 100% of anything. We're crooks. We've conned all those old ladies. Yeah, we conned those old ladies, because that's what we do. But this time, we told them the truth. <laughs> you got to see the hand of God in that. Dad, if, if we bring this oil well in, and it's a gusher, everyone who's got a stock certificate is going to show up and say, where's my piece of the pecan pie? And we don't got enough pie to go around, Dad. Wouldn't be more than a week, and both of us would be sitting in the hooskow on the way to the state pen. Let's say they up and lynch us first. Well, that's just not fair. No, sir, we struck oil. That's right. Now, how many men walking the earth can say that? Maybe, maybe a handful. We did it. I don't have to be called Dry Hole Everett anymore. I'm an oil man. And you want me to walk away from it? There's nothing else to do. All right, look. We'll cap the well. We'll tell all the widows and old Thurman and 
Juniper Sioux that it's nothing but a dry hole. We gotta take what we got and get as far away from Texas as we can get if we know what's good for us. California. They're bringing a plenty of oil to California. Come on, it's the promised land, Dad. Don't look at me like that. Right? Just get that cuttings bucket and let's get out of here before someone finds out the awful truth. Can't do it, Doc. Do what? I can't walk away from it. <laughs> well, walk away? Heck, we're gonna run away. Right, we've done a hard times before and we'll do it again. If we do, we will get away clean. No, sir. This is a vindication of my entire life. <laughs> Dad, Dad, I'm a two-bit flim-flam man. The only thing worse than that is being a two-bit flim-flam man sitting in the state pen for the rest of his born days. You said we were going to hit the woodbine sand at 3,500 feet. Well, you know what it measured out to? Exactly 3,500 feet. You part of the Red Sea, Doc. A true hand-to-God miracle is what it is. Well, I, I ain't Moses, and I ain't part of no Red Seas. I, I've been eating a lot of pecan pies made by little old ladies and stealing their money, and, and I can face that. I don't know why you can't. You live so long without self-respect that you, you forget what it feels like. But right now, we got a chance at it, and I'm gonna grab it. You should, too. But you're not gonna take it away from me, and you're, you're not gonna take it away from them winners. Widow. Those sweet little old widows. Well, maybe they're not all little. They're not all sweet, certainly. Uh, there's a few rattlesnakes amongst them, but nonetheless, they're widows. <laughs> Dad, this is delirium incarnate. We, we sold 500% of nothing. It's not nothing. It's a bona fide gusher is what it is, and you're not going to take it from them. The Jesus will not stand for it. Jesus? That's right, Jesus. But one day, you will stand in front of for judgment. And when that mighty day comes, the only thing between you and the eternal damnation is how you treated those winners. I'm, I'm more concerned with the Texas Rangers than the Holy Spirit, and, and let alone the lynch mob. Texas Rangers. Nobody's going to lynch you. Once you bring that black gold out of the ground, it'll be their salvation. They'll build statues to us and, and put them in parks where the children play. Yes, and the pigeons will relieve themselves on our likenesses. Dad, you're, you're drunk. Yeah, I'm drunk. I'm drunk as a skunk. Well, I will not leave that well. And neither will you. We're going to bring that well in. <sighs> oh, gosh darn lousy tube of Jack of Manoa! Ah! Ah! Why couldn't you have done this 30 years ago? 20 years ago when I was still an honest man before I became a tin horn huckster and a defiler of widowhood. Why couldn't you have done this in Oklahoma where for the first time in my life I believed every lie I told? Why'd you have to let me sink so low, Lord, and just dangle it right in front of my face? Let me... Let me be one or the other, a, a crook or a, a righteous geologist of all men is petroliferous who struck it rich. Do you think this is funny, do you? I know funny, Lord, and this is not funny. You get it out of your system? Not all. You know. We're going to bring in that well. You bet. And we're going to be rich. <laughs> yeah. Until they, till they tarn feather us. <laughs> if they do, it'll be with the oil we find.
what we're asking of the investors is to write us another check for five. Oh, I can't do it. Well, if you're not hungry, we can just. No, Martha Jean, it's got nothing to do with food. I came here tonight to swindle you. That well you own a piece of? It's already oversold by 500%. Your shares are worthless. Well, you scoundrel, you lowlife, uh, you... Flimflam man. Yes, you flimflam man. The only true thing I've ever said concerns my affections for you. You're the true treasure of my life. My tender mercy, the, the urgent prayer of my heart. So if you just write the check, I'll be on my way. Oh, I will not give you two cents. Oh no, please, you I didn't get finish. out of my house right I, now. I, I, I haven't, can... I haven't finished. Just let me explain. Please sit down. In exchange for the five hundred dollar check, I'll leave you a thousand dollars in cash. I just didn't want Boyd to think I left empty-handed. Oh, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, don't stick the law on us until we bring the well in. Oh. Oh, dear. Only this time I really did strike oil. I reckon I'll be arrested this time. Why have you come here to tell me this? After you deceived me so cruelly. Because I care for you, ma'am. <laughs> I just wanted to be square with you. I wanted to give you back the thousand dollars I took. That you swindled from other widows. The same way you swindled me. I don't want that money. I don't want you here. I want you out of my house. Get out of my house. Go on now, get. So where you been the last day and a half? I had some unfinished business. The prospect? Yeah, I guess you could say so. How'd it pan out? Oh, it's it a dry hole. How'd you do with the widow Tyler? Oh, good. Yeah, I, I, I pulled another 500 from her. Checks sit right here on top of the pile. So why the long face? I don't know. Heartburn, something. Yeah. Yeah. They work 24 hours a day, bound and determined to bring that well in. And when the word got out around the counter that Doc and Dad might be bringing in a well, the word spread, because if a well came in, it meant in the midst of drought and depression, in the vast desert of despair in which most of America was wandering, there would suddenly be a spring of hope, the promise of jobs, steady wages, and an end to the gnawing pain of hunger and fear that had tormented so many for so long. Pretty soon, the big oil companies came in and just as a precaution, bought up all the wood for fuel that there was to be had in three counties. All right, boys, let's help them get the wood. Why, well, it's about time. Yeah, the last load that I could find, Doc. There's not another stick around to be had for love of money. What? Gee, also fat tanner. If we don't feed these boilers, we're gonna have to shut down. I'm sorry, Mr. Everett. There just ain't no more wood. That's all it is, too. Look, we're this close to a gusher. And you're telling me, because of lack of wood, we got to shut down. I'm sorry, Mr. Everett. 
Now listen to me. Everybody get in here. Come on. Get in, get in. When we bring this well in, it is going to blow black gold out over each and every single one of us. And there'll be more jobs playing good wages here than you can shake a stick at. And your general store rivals Sears Robot. But none of that's going to happen if this rig shuts down. We can't make wood appear with magic, Doc. We ain't got none. I know, Thurman, I know. But look, we got plenty of crates and another piece of wood here. We'll use all that up. But I see a lot of rubber around here, and that burns just as good as wood. What are you talking about? Oh, well, I'll tell you what he's talking about. Thurman, you, you got wheels on your car, right? You got tires on your truck? Yes, sir. Well, I'm here to tell you, if we don't bring this well in, you're not going to find a place worth going to, and you're not going to be able to afford the money for the gasoline to get there. That's right. You got to sacrifice, just like the Israelites of old did in the Holy Temple of Jerusalem. Well, here's the altar. And the tires on your automobiles are the lambs and the bullocks and the sheaves of wheat, and it's time to tithe by heavens because the good Lord, he helps those who help Amen. themselves. Amen. 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 Now, come on, let's bust up these boxes and get the rest of that wood. Let's go, move it. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. What's that? Black folk and white folk working together because they, uh, they believe in us. You're just a softy. Yeah. And nobody else had seen anything like it either. Colored folks and white folks all working together. And some people might have said it was greed that united us. But I don't believe that. It was more like a tiny window had opened up in the heavens. And people realized that they're all going to sink, or they're all going to swim together. And the word spread quicker than an oil fire. Dad Everett and Doc Boyd had brought in a gusher. And the problem for Doc and Dad was that they couldn't touch a cent being brought in by their own oil well. For the minute they signed any kind of a deal, it would become apparent to one and all 
that their company had been sold ten times over. So far, they were keeping the widows at bay, but they needed getaway money, and they needed it fast. Where are you folks going? He said the oil strike would be a blessing. Well, we'll get something out of it because of them stock certificates you paid me with. But for the rest of the color folk around here, it's been a curse. Well, well, what do you mean? Most of these folk were sharecroppers. Worked the land for as long as anybody can remember. Or a company came in, bought up all the minimum rights, and instead of crops, they planting dairies. All the jobs were going to white folk. White folk that just got here and then led a day in Cornville till this strike came through. I thought it was hard times before, Doc, but these folk got nothing now. Just, uh... Just give us a second here, Tanner, okay? Dad. Now, uh, these color folk might be the answer to our prayer. They might be the getaway money that we need. What are you talking about? Just, just back me up. Now, well, Mr. Irving, this is an abomination. I mean, that's what it is, sir. It's an abomination. It's being driven off your land like the Israelites taken in the Babylonian exile. Yes, sir, that's just what it's like. Let me, uh, let me ask you something. You, you folks, you have a you have a little church at the edge of town, is that right? And let me ask you something. You, you own that church. We do. And you own the land under it? Free and clear. Well, that's all uh that's all I need to know. Tell you what, you you get the folks to come to the church tonight, and they're gonna hear the doggone his prayer meeting they've ever heard in their entire life. Doc, I gotta tell you, most of the color folk in this town hold you and dad to blame for what happened to them. They say that if we had come in, they'd still be on their land. You might want to think twice about the prayer meeting. Tanner, why don't you just get the congregation in the pews? Because the Lord is my... Well, he's my rock and shield. And yea, though I may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. No evil. All right, we'll see you tonight, OK? Now, y'all know Brother Irving is a good man. I know him. You know him. We all know him. And we know that he is a righteous man who walks with the Lord. Amen. 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 But even a righteous man can be misled by the devil. Now, I ain't saying that there is a white devil or two who took Brother Irving, bamboozled him, Horns swaddled him, hustled and flim flammed him. Mm -mm. Nobody here heard me say that. But what I am saying is that all the blessings that were to rain down like manna from heaven onto the backs of the children of Israel turned out to be a curse. Brother Irving, well, you asked if we gather here today. Just, just in case things don't go as planned, you want to keep that Model A running around back? You got it. To listen to Dr. Boyd. And since Brother Irving is one of our own, I said, all right, we will hear what he has to say. Then we will decide whether it be fish or fowl, angel or devil. Speaking of, Which are you, brother? Angel or devil? Where's all the jobs you promised? No jobs, no land, no nothing. Because of you, get thee behind me, Satan. From the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verse 17. And they brought Daniel. And they cast him into the lion's den. And then a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king rose early the next day. And he went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came there, he cried out in a pain voice, O oh, Daniel, is thy God able to deliver thee from the lions? And Daniel, he said unto the king, My God hath sent his angel. And he hath shut the lion's mouth. He hath shut the lion's mouth on this Lord's day. And why? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach us? Why was Daniel not hurt in the lion's den? For as much as innocence is found in me before thee, I have done no hurt. 
That's what Daniel said. I have done no hurt. But somebody's hurting tonight. Oh, somebody's in pain tonight. It might be a mother who can't feed her child. It might be a father who can't support his family. It might be a son who's heartbroken to see the look in his father's eye. Or it might be a man who's lost the love of a woman. But somebody's in pain tonight. And that's a fact. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. amen? So I say to you, from the pulpit of the Bethel's church, Bethel, you all know what that means? It means house of God. So I say to you, from the pulpit, in this house of God, that Jesus will not let this injustice stand. So I say to you, from the pulpit of this church, on this Lord's Day's evening, that if the only thing that you own in this life is this church right here, then I say, you form a company with whatever you got left. And we drill a well right down to the middle of this boat. And we leave the rest up to Jesus. That man is the devil himself. And every member of the congregation will get an equal share in the Beth L. Petroleum Company. Uh, the doc and I will take a simple fee for bringing in the well, the drilling and such. A thousand dollars up front. Ain't no offense. Just to make sure you don't skip town with it, we finna hold on to the money till you drill that well. Dry hole of gushing. You'll get your fee. Skip town, huh? Look. Why would we skip town, Mr. Irving? We, we brought in that gusher at the Juniper Sioux. You saw it. Mr. Everett, you drill that well down at least 3,500 feet. Then whichever way it turn out, you'll get your pay. The same black folk and white folks worked together once again. But this time, it was to bring in the Beth L number one. For the first time anyone could remember, white folks were returning the favor. As for Doc and Dad, their plan was pretty straightforward. Stall the widows long enough to spot a well through the pulpit of the Bethel Church, and then declare a dry hole, and then collect their thousand dollars and get out of Texas before the law could get to them. The only problem was that at 1,200 feet, they hit a And right there, in the house of God, they brought in the second largest well in all of East Texas. I got it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> can't believe it. Well, now I've seen everything. That, my friend, is a true miracle of the Lord. Let us give thanks. Let us give thanks. Lord, in your grace and mercy, you sent us two angels that we mistook as devils and showered us with your abundance. How great is your works, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we say amen. 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 Well, uh, the Reverend Reese and uh, Mr. Irving, where's my thousand uh, dollars? Our thousand dollars. David Henry Everett and Heinrich Bumstetter. Twenty years Everett. Uh, that'd be me. Bumstetter. Bumstetter. Anyone here uh, named Bumstetter? A.K.A. Horatio Gaddis Boyd. Oh, yes, well, well, that would be me. To what do we owe this pleasure? We both under arrest. Oh, 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 
pretty grim, huh? Yeah. Can they hang us for fraud? Well, if the judge doesn't, I reckon the widows will. Never you mind, gentlemen. I intend to mount a vigorous defense. Even though, as a public defender appointed by the courts, I receive no remuneration. I assure you, you'll get your money's worth. Well, I feel better already. Oh, yeah. All rise. The Superior Court of Cornville County is now in session. The Honorable Judge J.G. Watson presiding. May God bless this honorable court, the great state of Texas, and the United States of America. Please be seated. Mr. Grimm, prosecution may proceed. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, this case is as sad and tragic as it is open and shot for the victims. How about little old ladies? Widows, sainted, silver-haired angels not only from our fair state of Texas, but from as far off as the exotic climes of Oklahoma. These two villains, Lotharians. He's talking about you. Have left a swath of human misery behind them, like a vast thundering tornado of a moray run amok. Oh. The witnesses who will come before you will not seem like strangers, but rather, with their wrinkled eyes and weathered brows, they will seem like your own mothers and grandmothers. In what should have been their golden years, they were twice victimized, I say. For it was not only their life savings that were stolen, but their heart's affections as well. Yeah, we're dead. And the prosecution will present evidence in black and white from out of the accused very mouths that will prove their guilt beyond any doubt. Therefore, the state will feel no compunction whatsoever in asking for, nay, in demanding that justice be served by extracting the maximum penalty possible upon those who would prey upon, upon our very own mothers and grandmothers so that they serve out the rest of their days in the hell of their own devices. He's very good. Oh, I'd convict us. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Mr. Wimple, for the defense. <clears throat> Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, Though there is no doubt about my client's moral turpitude, the defense does not accept Mr. Grimm's characterizations of our clients. Well, that's telling him, Wimple. Yeah, for a second there, I was a little nervous, but you threw him for a loop, buddy. Ever faithful. Mr. Grimm, you may call your first witness. Your Honor, the prosecution calls Mrs. Flora May Sims. Call Flora May Sims. Place your hand on the Bible. Our goose is good. You don't know the half of that. What do you mean? You'll find out. I do, so help me God. Mrs. Sims, what is your marital status? I'm a widow. My condolences, ma'am. And I appreciate what you must be going through. You notified me, did you not, that you were one of the accused Bumstetter, AKA Doc Boyd's victims in the fair state of Oklahoma. Is that not true? Yes, it is, sir. And the accused uh, found your name 
in a death notice announcing the demise of your uh, beloved husband. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. And then he paid a call on you and said that your late husband had agreed to enter into a scheme to back up his oil venture. Is that not correct? I believe so, sir. And then, I shall simply say, he wooed you, made you believe that he was romantically inclined to you, and then abused your affections by asking you to invest in his worthless oil well. Is that not also correct? You've told me, in fact, that he wrote love letters to you, and I have asked you to bring one of them with you, which we would like to introduce as prosecution's exhibit A, Your Honor, so that all may hear not only the extent of the depravity of the accused, but a confession. A confession in his own hand of the crimes he committed in wresting away your life savings and your affections. Hmm? Was that a question? You were stupid enough to put it in writing. Would you read aloud from the letter? Oh, Lord, here it comes. My dearest, you once protested to me that we were too old for such foolishness as love. And fool I know I was to ever hope that such a one as you could ever smile kindly upon such a one as I. For I have become, as King David said about himself in old age, a song for drunkards that sit at the village gate, an object of scorn and derision, always chasing rainbows and never finding the pot of gold. And now, in a prison of my own making, I know how wounded you were by my deceit. You have demanded never to see me again because of my disgraceful conduct in swindling not only you but others as well. And of course, you were right to do so. But in our brief time together, believe me when I say, to my surprise, I found life's true treasure. I have at last found oil but it does not equal the wealth I found in your embrace. And were it in my power, I would not trade that for a hundred king's ransoms. Not for all the oil beneath the earth, nor all its diamonds and rubies, would I, would I trade the sweet warmth of the touch of your hand upon my arm. I remember that gentle caress as it was on that glorious morn. When we walked alongside the fence beside your meadow with the sun golden upon your soft skin and the feel of your arms around my neck. In the words of the orphan child, David Copperfield. I wish I had died then with that feeling in my heart. I should have been more fit for heaven than I have ever been since. For you are the flower of my heart, the master of my soul. Yours, Horatio. Your Honor, I object. You can't object to your own witness. Then I object to all this sniffling. Oh. Your Honor, may I say something? You go right ahead, Mrs. Sims. I, I had a feeling that Horatio was a scalawag. 
But I wanted to believe. And perhaps I am a fool as well. For I still do. And despite what Mr. Grimm here says, I'm not some helpless, silver-haired, wrinkled-browed, plaster saint. I've been to a rodeo and a county fair and a church picnic or two. But the only poetry and beauty I have ever known was in the few months that Horatio and I had together in this bundle of love letters and the remembered words of precious endearments. And though I'll speak no ill of the dead, it was a darn sight more than I ever knew with that lazy good-for-nothing that I put in the grave after 35 years of marriage. And truth be told, it was worth every penny. And I'd pay it all again and, and more to boot. But I know one thing, that with the grace of God, these men can be saved. Now, I know that the law might say they deserve prison, but I'm supposedly the one they wronged. And I would ask you to set them free. Object, Your Honor. I strenuously object. Oh, just sh shut up and sit down, or you'll wind up in the clean for contempt. Now, all of us here know, especially in tough times like these, what the prospector or the white cat of fields. Open at this time, finally. Their lucky number will come up. And these two boys could have capped that well up. Said it was a dry hole, made their getaway just like they did before. No would have been the wiser. They didn't do that. I'm scratching my head in wonder because it couldn't have been greed that made them do it. I mean, they had to have known that they was going to be caught, that their scheme was uncovered. Because they brought that well in, the whole part of this state just may see better taste. Furthermore, we now have a witness that came to this court bent, I dare say bent, on vengeance with righteous indignation for the wrong committed against her, and is now asking this court for tender mercy well, I scratch in my head and wonder. So I'll tell you what. Before some of you all go looking for a rope and a tree, I'm going fishing. Try and deal with this bewilderment I find myself in. Court is recessed for one week. Oh, maybe two. Depends on the fish. The defendants, they will be held without bail. You had to write the letter, huh? Boys, you got a visit. Thank you, Deputy. Gentlemen? If you're a lawyer, we already got one. It ain't worth a bucket of spit, but we can't afford another. I've been called a lot of insulting names in my life, but lawyer isn't one of them. Yeah, then what are you trying to sell us? Because whatever it is, we ain't buying. <laughs> Gentlemen, I began life as a penniless 15-year-old runaway and developed only one talent. 
I took a deck of cards, and I practiced with each one, over and over again, tossing them at a slapboard wall. I must have done it straight for three months, till finally I could take any card from that deck, toss it from 15 feet away, and make it stick in any slat I wanted to. The advantage that I had was the number of people willing to bet I couldn't do it. I parlayed that mild talent, taking the money from suckers and bumpkins and a few city slickers who thought I was the bumpkin, and used that to buy my first oil lease. The name's Hines. L.D. Hines. Hines of Hines Petroleum? You can call me L.D. Well, howdy, L.D. Pleased to meet you. I guess you might have uh, might have heard about the well we brought in. Congratulations. It's a beaut. Heck of an achievement. Well, I predicted we'd hit the Woodbine Sand at 3,500 feet, and we did. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm the one who brought him in. <laughs> it's a pleasure and an honor to meet the oil man who brought in the Juniper Sioux number one. Oil man? I admire you boys, because like me, you possessed only a mild talent. And it had nothing to do with geology. It had to do with romance. Not swindling little old ladies, but offering them a chance to buy a commodity which, Lord only knows, must have run mighty scarce in the dry desert of their lives. What, what, what are you talking about? I predicted we would hit the woodbine sand at 3,500 feet, and, and we did. You predicted exactly the same thing to every widow in Oklahoma, nearly half the ones in Texas. Even a broken clock is right two times a day. Well, I take umbrage at your remarks, sir. Do you deny them? No, but a fella's got a right to take a little umbrage, and I, and I just took mine. Boys, boys, this is the greatest country on Earth because we are free to make our own choices, free to gamble on nothing but the mildest talent in the world. And you might not think so, but I admire you boys. I know that con of yours as well as I know that slapboard wall of mine. You could have capped that well and got away clean but you couldn't walk away from it. And I don't think it was about the money. I believe it was about respect. And for what it's worth, you've earned mine. Well, that means a lot coming from you, sir. Well, you boys pulled off something that even I could not do, either by blind luck, in which I do not believe, or by the grace of God, which I do not pretend to understand. You brought in the greatest sea of black crude this world has ever known. But you boys are sinking fast in it. And I got the only life vest inside. Well... I sense there's a deal to be made. There is. But you won't like it. Now, I'm willing to go and buy up all the widow's worthless shares. Every certificate you issued, I'll buy them all. From the widows, from the dials, even from Tanner Irving. I will risk my capital on the belief that I can convince every one of them to sign over their shares. I will issue the widow's new stock in the new company I create. That will then effectively let you off the hook. Sounds good so far. Yeah, so what uh, percentage do we get? You get to walk out of jail, boys. That's it. But we're the ones who brought it in. Yeah, we're the ones who discovered it. And for which I am truly grateful. But discovering and bringing it in is only half the trick, boys. Keeping it is what counts. That's the deal. Take it or leave it. It won't come again. But we'll be broke. You'll be free. And you can't put a price on freedom. Yeah. The one thing you can say about it is, it ain't free. I'll sign it under one condition. You don't have many cards to play, sir. I don't sign it as Heinrich Bumstetter. I get to sign it as Horatio Daedalus Boyd, PhD in geology and all matters petroliferous. It'll be for the very last time. Sign there. 
Dr. Boyd. And that was how L.D. Hines became the richest oil man in the history of the world. That's the Junipera Sioux and Thurman Dial when they were issued their new shares by L.D. Hines. Mr. and Mrs. Dial called in all the farmers to whom they had extended credit over the years. They took their credit slips, tore them up, and scattered them to the wind. All the widows lived out their years in comfort, beyond their dreams. The members of the Bethel Church became millionaires and sent their children to college and taught them all to be regular churchgoers and give their thanks to the Lord. As for Dad and Doc, they had not only seen the light, they were saved by it. Only a crazy man who got slapped in the face by genuine miracles and re refused to see them for what they are. So. When I get slapped upside the head by 10 miracles, not one, why, well, I know a good thing when I see it. But the real miracle is that every lie that I told turned out to be the truth. And not by my design, no, no, no. It was by that of a higher power. And I have felt the warmth of forgiveness and redemption and affection by my beloved wife, Flora May. And I have seen the light of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who well, in spite of my best efforts to backslide, he led me into the true treasure of life. He led me not only into matrimonial bliss, but into the ministry as well. And one of the greatest blessings that I have ever been granted is to preside over the wedding. My dear friend, Gusher Everett, and his beloved, Martha Jean. That's right, Dad and Doc were not only baptized in the new Bethel Church, but Doc became an ordained minister, the Reverend Heinrich Bumstatter. And people who met both Doc and Dad in their later years said no two finer Christian men had ever existed on the face of God's good earth. I'm Matt Ingersoll. We're from Marcus. That's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, you got the Antilocles. What is it? Anticlines. Anti what? Anticlines. Uh, the the uh, Anticlines and the uh, Fuller Brush Man. <laughs> and you're not going to be able to buy the gasoline to get you there. That's right, and you're blocking my close up right now, sir. Well, so if you walk that way, that'd be most appreciative. Oh, good. Oh, they got a camera right there. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Is it okay if we go upstairs now? <laughs> <laughs> I do not consider myself a weak man. That's my indigestion. That's how strong I am. Hi, I'm Matt Ingersoll. We're going to ring this doorbell one more time. I'm coming out here with a shotgun. <laughs> Mr. Everett, you drill that well down at least 3,500 feet, whichever way it turn out, you get your pet. Okay, and when we get the oil, we want to use it in these squeaky chairs. <laughs> Love alters not with its... Love not... I'm, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. My, my bad. I'm sorry, go ahead, my bad. <laughs> Only Greek God I ever heard of was Hercules. Well... In 176 countries, the most watched TV show in the world. We passed Babel. I'm not surprised, sir. I'm not surprised, sir. Yeah, this is a geographical, topographical, and a uh, mesmerizing uh, piece of uh, petro petroliferous. Petroliferous. <laughs> oh, really? You didn't like that one? I'm Matt Ingersoll. We're from. Whatever you're selling, I'm not buying. So I wish you farewell. Adios. Godspeed. Bye, Adios. <laughs> <laughs>
evil to me Would you just run away or climb the nearest tree I long to tell you your lips look kissable Would I be bold to say they're irresistible Although it's forward to mention romance If I don't speak them now I haven't got a chance If I said it all and put my heart on my sleeve Tell me could you care for me Shake your head or say I'm telling lies I long to hold you, you look so huggable Everything about you is just so wonderful Although it's forward to mention romance I've got to speak up now or we don't stand a chance Darling, I'm here with my heart on my sleeve So tell me, could you care for me? I've got to say it all and put my heart on my sleeve. So tell me, could you care for me? 